she she real picky. So, uh, and it comes to certain things, I get disappointed when I feel like I don't spend all my time trying to find something perfect. I feel like, and then when she get it, it's kind of like, oh, it's nice, but it's not really my style, or it's not really this. And you be, and I'm like, man. This is trash. So I'm all, I'm a, I'm a uh, gift certificate, gift card guy myself, and um, you know a little bit of cash and stuff like that, and then just some, I guess uh some little uh, I guess predictable things, the flowers, candy stuff like that. I mean, little things like that on top of just saying, okay, well, whatever it else that you feel like you need or you want, I'm gonna just go ahead and make sure you can get it. But I ain't gonna stress myself out about trying to pick it out myself. I just hit him with the. Hey, what are you feeling like? Do you need this thing? You know, that's what I hit him with real quick. You know what I mean? Just to get an idea because a lot of that other stuff, man, buying a lot of expensive stuff and it's just that and the third. That's the a rookie birds, mistake. Brother. Yeah, man. For the birds. Hey. We still thought we are rookies. Yeah. And it's all right. It's all right. Because listen, I ain't going to lie. When you first start dating somebody, it seems like you got to put in a little bit more than when you actually got some time in. Then it's like, okay, well, cool. We. We got a plan. We got a vision. We got goals, and we got responsibilities currently. So I'm a, you know, I ain't gonna worry so much about if this year, this Valentine's wasn't like set on fire. But when you when you dating, it's almost like you got to show and prove that you 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 do love them, that you are committed, that y'all are moving in the same direction. True. Yeah, man. Not true. Now she all oh, have she be with the other guys or to other guys who single who trying to find that Valentine Day. And a women who seem trying to find that better thing. What tip you got for them? Man, I got my, my tip is go to my website, man. I'm working on the training course to be able to help uh, women attract quality men. You know, first of all, I want to try to explain to the women that it is some trash dudes and there are some quality guys. If they know the difference, then they one going to have better successes with it. But at the same time, that's just to say that all men ain't trash like a lot of women believe, you know. So a lot of women have this notion that, oh, man, all y'all men are alike. All y'all men date the same. All y'all want the same thing. And I'm trying to, you know, dispel that notion with the training course and just kind of put them in position to know what to do when they meet a quality guy and, you know, how to attract them. Right. So that's what I would say. Go to my website, man. Check out my my training course. It's going to be up in about a week or two. And, uh, you know, sign up for that email list, man, so that you'll be able to get the first access to the course and also the discounted rate. Oh, okay. She can get, well, you get discounts on the show. <laughs> huh? Get discounts. Hey, say we will talk with George and Freddie. Get a two percent discount. <laughs> we work something out. We work something out. You know what I mean? Put a plug in and, and we, we figure it out from there. Okay. No right. doubt. <laughs> now, let me ask you as far as that training course. Do you, um, did you come up with it because there was more of a need for it? Because a lot of people, sometimes they go to counseling or they want counselors that are from their church or non-denominational and things of that nature. You know what I mean? So did you decide that um, it was best just to put a training course in place for those for those heathens and sinners that be out there and don't want to go to church? <laughs> it's not. It's for everybody, bro. And really, I think yeah, I, 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 just because it is a need out there, you know, in terms of people speaking in the relationship space, you got, you know, fellas that's trying to to impart upon women certain things that they need to know about men. And then you have women that, you know, are speaking about how men need to get it together, step it up, do all this, that, and the third. But in the end, it's not really anything that have a solution to the end of it, right? Or a solution um, in, in the root of all of it. So, you know, I'm looking at how it's, how it's going down in, in the relationship space right now. And I'm saying to myself, okay, I got to come up with something that creates a solution to this problem where everybody kind of going at each other's neck and talking about how you know women ain't like they used to be and women saying men ain't like they used to be at the end of the day you know i feel like we still value each other it's just that we have to feel like we can trust in that person we feel like that also that opportunity of having something real is possible so you know i'm just trying to instill that same belief that it is possible but now when you get the opportunity don't don't mess it up don't fumble it yep is that well, let me ask you why is that opportunity so sparse is it because of social media? Because you, you see a lot of uh, people posting things on social media. And I might have asked you this question before, mm -hmm. but everything that they posted on social media really is not all that it is. You see what I'm saying? Right. And I think let's talk about when I say talk about social media is social media is designed to have an A side. You never really see the B side unless they're going through it and they're like, oh, 
you know, I'm, I'm trying to die today or anything right. like that. But 90% of social media is all A-side stuff. I'm on vacation. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. here flossing here. Oh, I'm chilling here. You know, it doesn't get to, you know, this or the pictures that you see on social media. And that can be um, very intoxicating in mm-hmm. some form or fashion. But it could also be very much as a letdown. Because if you sit in here and all you do is look at somebody's social media post, you could have yeah. that. Uh, inception about the person or concept of the person like, yo, I thought you was like this. Now right. all of a sudden you get with me and you want to be flat. You know what I mean? Where that person right. that was tossing up and doing that other stuff on social media, I want to see them. I want to see them 24 hours a day. Like right. I was, you know what I mean? Profiling your, your media profile. See what I'm saying? Is mm-hmm. that um, in this eight, I mean in this, in this social media area, is that where you see a, the greatest disconnect? And the reason why I'm saying that not to talk about politics was even when you look at the people that invaded the Capitol, they were so stupid. They was posting it on social media. So that guy right. was like, thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thank you. You made my job yeah. so easy. <laughs> Absolutely. And I th- and I hope they don't let it ride like how they how they do with a lot of other things where they just kind of let things dim- simmer down with some time. And then, yeah. they, you know, they, they come out real quick. They arrest a few people and then they all oh, everybody else walk. I hope that don't happen. But yeah. um, I think that that that. Where when it comes to uh, social media, what I see a lot is everybody just want to have a voice. So everybody has a platform, but yeah, everybody isn't qualified to speak on what they're talking about. Not only, you know, from a, a standpoint of having a background on it or, you know, going and, and getting certified or, you know, getting a degree in that field. But at the same time, just in real life um, experience. And I see to me personally, I'm like, how can a person speak on relationships and and trying to help people if they haven't even had success in relationships themselves, whether that be, you know, finding somebody, getting married, you know, going through the ups and downs, the ins and outs and still trying to figure it out with the children, with, you know, having different personalities in the household, all that. Right. And so I see a lot more people just feeling like, hey, listen, I got something to say, even though what I have to say doesn't really lead you anywhere. It's just some information that sound good, it either be clickbait or it just be something that's kind of shock value. But at the end of the day, it's not rooted in, you know, say I'm trying to redirect y'all to having positive situations. Like yep. I see men talk about, um, you know, relationships from the space of, hey, this is how you get them, dog. This is what you do to to, to uh, coach these women, to, to, you know, influence these women to do whatever it is that you want them to do. And then I see women that say, hey, listen, what you got to do, girl, you got to, you know, it's the city girl mentality. It's this girl, you drop it like it's hot, you flex, you you twerk a little bit, you show them some of that ass, whip your hair, whatever the case is, and that's what's going to get them. And at the end of the day, nobody really, in my opinion, is talking about the things that make true relationships work and ups and downs. So me, what I've been trying to do personally, bro, just to show that side B for myself is to bring my wife home. You know, and I've been doing some lives and I'm going to do some more lives with her involved. And I'm asking her questions that I'm sure people want to know about me or about, you know, my marriage or my relationship from the standpoint of stuff we went through and let her speak. Because what I found out is when you're dealing with a relationship space as a man, it's almost hard for women to trust you unless another woman can speak to what you saying as if it's true. So if I'm just saying, hey, you got to do this and women, y'all got to do this. These are things that work and all of that then they want to see some validation via the woman that I'm supposed to be satisfying and hearing if what I'm saying is it being implemented in my own relationship. And I don't see that a lot also when it comes to social media. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. You know, I mentioned church in the beginning, but some of the most successful counseling um, sessions that we had was joint with um, the counselor and his wife and me and my wife, because it was like we were both in a place now where everything was neutral. Like, for instance, when I was out of order, sometimes the counselor didn't check me. His wife did. Now, wait a minute, George. I heard you say this, that, and the third. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I would pop up like, okay, because my wife is sitting there grinding. Yeah, get him. And then he would look right at my wife and be like, Denise, I see. I can read it in your face. you like, yo, go get him. But this is the reason why he's doing this. And I'd be like, oh, I see the, mm-hmm. the, 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 the dual, duality here when it comes to how it works. Both yeah. person has to be secure enough to be able to talk openly and transparently about their feelings without being judged. But on the same notion too, there has to be some checks and balances from the outside person 
that you respect because it's coming from them. You see what I mean? And mm-hmm. not somebody else. Like if a man would have said it to my wife, she would have rolled her neck, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But mm-hmm. because a woman said it, 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 it resonated a little bit. She received right. it more you know, than just it rolling off her back and moving on. So I definitely, definitely can attest to that method and strategy because it has worked for me, you know, in numerous times. 21 going on 22 years of marriage. It has worked. Right. And that that's what you're talking about. 21, 22 years of marriage is what a lot of people right now feel like is impossible to have. Or if it is 20, so 20 something odd years of marriage that is, you know, infidelity going on or it's something, you know, that they feel like, oh, it's tainting the quality or the value of the relationship or the marriage. And that it's like it's not really real. And to me, I, I like I said, it's just those cases where it's happening aren't getting enough credit. So a lot of people just feel like, oh, this is what, you know, this this uh, chaotic type of situationship type of relationship is all to be expected when it comes to, you know, the, the single and, and dating space out here. So in the end, like I said, uh, when you ask the question of, you know, what kind of prom- motivated me to come up with this course, like that's that's really it. Like at the same time of uh, me being a man, like on a from a professional level, like I, I say, I have to say to women, like, listen, I'm from everybody. I'm not biased to just men. You know, I am a man, but I I can speak to some of the things that us men have to be held accountable for as well. But at the same time, it's like, you know, there is a way for this to work. It is a a science to this. And a lot of times, you know, it it just comes from listening and and trying to understand the other party. So I think nowadays when you got women that don't really see value in men because they feel like they're going to get hurt or the men ain't on a level and all this and you name it. A lot of times it's, it's not any of those things, but it's just a lack of belief. It's a lack of uh, uh, trust. It's rooted in fear and you got all this doubt. And so now, you know, with the course I'm trying to bring forth is just trying to, like I say, really bring back, you know, something that can re-encourage and reinvigorate women to say, OK, well, listen, it's some good guys out here. I know some. Yeah. But, you know, you're just not giving them enough credit. And because of that, a lot of women aren't doing what they got to do on their end out of resentment, out of, you know, feeling like, why should I, who is this person? Who is this guy to come in and, and bring forth all of this change and trying to structure things in a certain way? Like I built this from my, like, it's just so much, you know, that are in women's mind from a, a frustration and anger standpoint that it's hard for a man to be like, man, I'm gonna deal with it. I got options too, yeah. you? you know? So that's what it was all about. Yeah, man, I can definitely respect yeah. that. Cause I know that you know, people talk about 21 years. When me and my wife sit back and think about that, we're like, man, time flies. Because the reason why we're saying that is because we were both grinders. I met my wife in college. That's why it's 21 years. You know, it wasn't like I had a career or anything like that. We met at school. Mm-hmm. And so we started dating all the way back then in 97 from that. And it was like the what attracted me to her was the fact that she was a grinder. She was in school and she was working. And then she had a part-time job too. So she had two part-time jobs while she was in school. Mm-hmm. I was uh-huh. doing the same thing. I was in school full-time and I had two part-time jobs. One job I was working when I got out of school, my weekend job was I was doing security uh, uh, for a DJ company that used to do parties here in New Jersey. And we mm-hmm. post up Friday uh-huh. and Saturday. They didn't do any uh, uh, parties on Sunday because we all had school on Monday. See mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So, I I was like, yo, you know, if she's out here grinding like this and I'm grinding like this, then we can grind together. You see what I'm saying? And that was the thought process on it. And I was like, you know, if anything, God forbid, happened to me, I know that she'll be able to take care of the kids because she's not that, oh, woe was me type of person and mentality. You see what I mean? And so when I say our lives went in sections, our lives went in sections because I always let her do what she wanted to do. I never said, oh, no, you got to do this because. And she always let me do what I wanted to do. Never held me back. Like, why are you doing that? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Mm-hmm. You see what yeah. I mean? So while I was building this business, even though it took three or four years, it was a day-by-day process. So when you look up and the business is built, so yeah, you've been together seven years. But in that process, she got it, you know, she got her job as a physical therapy assistant, PTA, and I'm in the real estate game or I'm teaching martial arts classes. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you look up and oh man, it's been seven years, but I only feel like three. Because right. four right. of those years I was building the business. Four of those years you was going to school and doing all the other stuff. We was only connecting on the weekends. It really wasn't. Yeah. You see, so fast forward now, after a couple of businesses that I built, 
kids, this, that, and the third, you look up and go, man, it's been 21 years. It seemed like yesterday because we haven't really, you yeah. know what I mean? Like we haven't been together every day, all day. We all been right. still grinding, right. still been doing this. And then you had kids in the mix of me sitting in the car at a baseball, I mean, at a basketball uh, training. You see what I'm saying? Doing my podcast because yeah. my son yeah. and my daughter got a train. You see what I'm saying? Like, right. and I just yeah. wave to her while she picked the kids up. That kind of stuff. <laughs> you see what I mean? Because we yeah. got to get it done. Yeah. So yeah. it's definitely, I'm saying that to say 21 years is definitely possible, but don't make that out greater than it is because everything is a step day by day day by day there's a new challenge day by day there's you know new things to do and if you just take it that way it doesn't always have to be infidelity because um or anything like that because i know a lot of people go for the for the first thing that's not it um because infidelity is my thing you know my thing is not alcohol my thing is not drugs my thing is not that it's that infidelity because that cuts in both people. Infidelity mm-hmm. affects kids too. You see what I mean? Yeah. So I decided way when I got married, I was like, oh, now I'm done. Ain't going to have no side chicks. I'm not going to have to worry about baby, baby, you know, the baby mama drama or somebody popping at the door and be like, hey, he's yours. You know what I mean? Like, nah, yeah. none of that. You know what I mean? And so because I, that was never in my mind, my mind was only to build businesses and grind, take care of my family. You see what I mean? So I put yeah. my head down. That being said, I'm not trying to talk long or take up your interview, plans, but that being said, it was like, it wasn't easy. Like, people knew because I was disciplined, women would come at me. And they'd come at me and say some things that you just sit there and shake your head and just be like, I can't believe that this grown woman like this is coming at me and saying this stuff to me, sometimes by myself, sometimes when I had my infant son with me holding his hand, they'd be whispering stuff. I'm like, this is crazy. Right. You know, you know what I mean? And I ain't going to lie. There was times when I was in drought and I was like, yo, all I got to do is show up. Right. And I had to go back to this. You see what I'm saying? I had to go back to what my original, my original principle was, yeah. was no, nah, that's not going to happen to me because of all the things that I'm putting in place. And more importantly, so my kids have respect for me. You see what I'm saying? And so it definitely wasn't easy, um, but you can get there. You know, we can definitely get there if that's your goal, because it's just one step at a time, one day at a time, one issue at a time. Yeah, true. Well, definitely. Well, definitely. So I got one little different. So what about the ones? You know, I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. Why do women feel that the man has to take care of them? They don't have to do nothing. And they, they don't do nothing they're supposed to do. And reverse this reverse scenario. The man is the same way. want to do all this stuff. And they ain't got to do nothing. What do you say about that? Like, how do you feel about that as a coach? And how you tell people who come with a mindset like to you saying, look, this is what she's supposed to do. This is what she's supposed to do. He's supposed to do. Why he got to do this? How you handle that? I mean, whoever that is need to find somebody that share them same, those same thoughts and that same mindset, period. I think, like, man, listen, if it were me, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out. Once I hear something like that, is it more? Is there more of that? Like, you know, sometimes when a person says a statement like, oh, you know, a man's supposed to do that, you're supposed to, this, this is what you're supposed to do. A lot of times it ain't just in one area, it's in multiple areas. And if that don't sit well with you, if it didn't sit well with me, I definitely wouldn't be around too long just to, to see that come to fruition. And now I'm stuck into something or I'm entrenched in something that is hard to get out of. Nah, I can't see myself living like that. So to me, I know it are so there are some people who share a an entitled mindset. Now, where that comes from, you know, people have their own stories and their own testimony. So I ain't gonna say, oh, it's just this one thing. Because many people say, Oh, I didn't grow up with a dad, or I didn't grow up like this, or I grew up like that, or I was raised like this. So I am who I am because of that. Regardless, though, to me, it's like if you don't share, you don't got somebody that share that same mindset, then you know, you need to find that person because. For me, I can't I can't see myself having seeing somebody that says, hey, I don't really believe in what she believes in in terms of what all I need to do versus all what her responsibilities are. So, you know, if that is the case, that ain't going to work, you know, too much longer. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what they're going to do. Or I, I would say, hey, I, what, what are we going to do? Because I don't share that same mindset. And like I said, you know, when it comes to people who are entitled um, if they don't have somebody that's willing to, to continue to feed that that beast, then it's gonna be tough out here. But 
I wouldn't want somebody to go through that who doesn't share that and just feel like I got to put up with it. Absolutely not. Yeah. So, yeah, man, look, I so, definitely agree with that assessment because a lot of times um, that assessment puts so much stress on the person that that's where the anger comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, resentment. I'm doing all of this and it ain't enough. I'm doing that and it yeah. ain't enough. And then yeah. all of a sudden what will happen is if it's the man, he'll be like, oh, I'm going to go someplace where I'm appreciated. And mm -hmm. if it's the woman, she'll do the exact same thing. Oh, I'm going to go someplace where I appreciate it. Well, I don't got to do all this. I can do half of this and he still loves me. You see what I mean? Because mm -hmm. that, like, I agree with you. That type of mentality where you got to find a person that can deal with that. But I also seen it to the point where it's always never enough. Right. $10,000 engagement ring isn't enough. Uh, yep. You can't wear these kind of clothes on your behind because of this, that, and the third. Now, when it's your money and you're spending it, you yep. find a way to make that outfit work. But when exactly. I'm buying that outfit for you, it got to be off of this coat rack, this, that, and the third, and it got to have that price tag. And that's the part yep. about this thing I don't understand. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it causes all kinds of problems. That's why, I mean, even in our experiences, talking to some of our friends and single people, I honestly, and I'm saying it on this show, y'all don't take it wrong, but I honestly can understand how a man can put a hand on a woman. If I'm, li if I'm lying, I'm dying. I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> because the stress that is put on that, you know, people talk about women snapping. Men just snap because it's like you don't know what I sacrificed, what I had to do to get this for you, and then it's still not enough, or it's like, uh, you know what I mean, kind of thing, mm -hmm. or it could have been better, or you lie and say um, you liked it. Then I hear you whispering to your girls, yeah, yeah. the alpha was yeah. just okay. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> stuff that completely crush you, you know? So yeah. I can definitely yeah, understand. Me, how bro, hold on, let me cut y'all. Because see, to me, bro, like stuff like that, I'm, I'm just a type of personality that I can't even, I can't even see myself going on too long. I'm like, listen, that's how you feel. Like you need to find, I'm, a, I'm, I'm the one saying, look, you need to find somebody that, you know, it's going to be the one that's going to be the paymaster. This, you know, even with, with dating my wife, sometimes there were moments where I believe that we weren't meant to be with each other. I'm like, man, look, maybe you need to find somebody that's going to be able to just do what you need to do. That's going to listen to your every, you know, uh, a wish and just, you know, yes, you're right. And like, like sometimes that that's not me. That's not me. So because I have my own mind, because I view things a certain type of way, like that, that is what it's going to be. Now you're going to have to learn me as well as I'm learning you. And it can't just be a, exactly. oh, it's all about how you feel or what you see and how you yeah. see it. Ah, so, you know, for that, like I, it, when I start to hear certain things like, oh, you know, it could have been better and this and that, mm, like that. I'm like, nah, see you already, you out of pocket, you out of line right now because of what, like you said, all I've, I, all I've sacrificed, all I've done just to at least try to put a smile on your face. The effort was there, even if you felt like it wasn't exactly it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that does crush you. And so for me, I'm like, listen, I'm not, I, I can't see myself continuing to, to feel like, okay, well, I'll make it up to you again. I, that, that just ain't my, that ain't my personality. Like, you know, if I'm doing all I can, like at least acknowledge that. And if you don't, I'm gonna make sure you do. And if at that point it still don't matter, then I recognize, okay, well, cool. This, this, this is a, a lost call. Right, right, right. And, and I find that it happened a lot of relationships that way, where you have one part, one part, and they feel like doing more than the other part, and the other part feel like doing less. Then you go on that part, at that person's opinion, they say the same thing. The other person just said, "He ain't doing this, or he ain't doing this, she ain't doing this." Then, 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 now going like you say, start breaking down slowly and slowly and slowly to get the point. Most, I think, most men say at first, "Uh, I can't do this." Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't do this right here. And then when you do that, then they thought to realize, wait, he actually not gonna do you actually serious about this. He actually going to leave. Then they start trying to change for what? Wow. Couple weeks, two weeks, they change the flip a little bit. Like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean. I mean, so how do you help people who do that to actually say when they know it's time to get out? And they you know, like you say, some people get them so long they feel like they can't find anybody, or it is they're not there for love anymore. It's just there for convenience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't want to leave. They don't want to start over again. Like what do you say to people like that? Who's no one ain't working for them, and just feel they need to get out. But they say it's just just there. You know, they're just over here now. I'm just I ain't with a little shell. I don't care nothing about what she says to me no more. I don't care about what he says no more. Like what do you do for that? Man, listen. I mean, it's 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 okay. It's all it's very little that you can do if the person recognizes. You know what? It's not going to be something for me to be able to just get out of easily. 
Now, it as a coach, it's you know, you can tell a person all that needs to be said. You can mention all the things that are, are weighing the pros and weighing the cons and showing them a clear depiction of their situation so that they can assess it and say, okay, well, this is something that I really want to do, or this has not made me happy anymore. And even when a person comes to that conclusion that no, I'm not happy, no, this isn't what I want, no, this isn't where I want to be or where I'm looking to go or with the person I'm looking, you know, to, to see myself in the future with, even still, it's like, but we got kids or the names are on the mortgage or this and that. Now, for me, like I, I that's where I fall back because depending on their circumstances, that's where they're going to have to figure out how they're going to get themselves out of that. And I can't readily say, hey, this is a, a one solution answer where I can go to anybody and say, OK, well, if you feel like this ain't it and you're ready to move on and you invest it so much. And now you're at a point where you feel like you're ready to step away like this, how you do it. You do this. You go down to the courthouse. You do it like nah, because it's not that easy. And like, you know, like George was saying, you know, when the kids are affected, not only do, do they get affected by infidelity or, or even other things. Man, when when that breakup happens, or when a person decides to step away, like listen, this is it's a it's never a clean break, or if it is, it's very seldom. Like you know, <laughs> one in a million seldom. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just saying that. I mean, with that being said, there's so much that co- goes behind trying to separate who gets what, where the children are going to live, who's going to be, you know, who's going to have parent parental um um, what I'm trying to say guidance over them you know for, for lack of a better term supervision and whatnot and so i mean it's like i say you can you can give it give them all they 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 need to see when it comes to what it is that their situation is is showing but at the same time if that person not ready to move on like you know all you can do as a coach is say hey this situation you know let's work to find a, a solution and if that solution is you know what it's time for me to move on well, then at that point, then I say, well, if that's where you feel like, you know, then it's up to you to make those steps and, and move in that direction. That's just going to make you happy. You have the right to to uh, have satisfaction and happiness in life. So whatever that is, like you got you and your partner, then got to work to see how y'all work, work through that uh, uh, situation. Two. Yeah, man. Well, just to wrap this up real quick. You know, I definitely agree with you because I remember one of the last counseling sessions I went to where the counselor looked at me right in my face. And he was like, y'all been coming here and y'all been coming here and you're coming here. He was like, look, I can't do anything for you at this point. You guys have to decide if you want to stay in this relationship or not. And when I got in the car after that session, I told my wife, I was like, I'm not coming here again. He said, because he's absolutely right. We have to decide what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. You know, we don't need him to validate our situation of yeah george leave or yeah denise you shouldn't be talking like that this that and the third boom 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 you see what i'm saying Mm -hmm. you have to decide and once i understood that it almost hit me like a ton of bricks because i was like man after all these years all this stuff was about me i have to decide how i'm going to do it or what i'm going to do this that and the third you know but you you look at people who break up in relationships and whether it was a child a child can tell you when that happened and how they affected me if, if it still affects them in their adult life. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, yeah. if it's a boyfriend and girlfriend, a husband and wife, if you ask them, they'll be like, well, what'd you take from that? You'll hear a lot of them say, man, I never should have left my wife. I never should have left my husband. That was the biggest mistake I made in my life. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's really just all about you and what you, what you, what you want to do, not for you so much, but your entire situation. Because that's really how I got through a lot of that stuff in my marriage where it was just like like you said you know i'm not doing my 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 uh, my, my, uh, my wife's boyfriend my ex-wife's boyfriend this that and third i'm not having somebody else raise my kids right. you know what i mean to have the ability to speak into my kids you see what i'm saying yeah. and all that other stuff and mm-hmm. vice versa because i know if, if, if i don't want that for myself i know my wife don't want that you see what i mean as well too yeah. to have you know daddy's girlfriend you know because the kids kind of get messed up from that a little bit you right. see what i mean because they're looking at both adults and parents and they feel like oh he's an adult so he can have input into my life you know those are the things that we don't look down the road for we'll be like yo i'm out so what tips you got for for the singles and for the couples for valentine's day 
So what tip you can throw on right quick to help him out, make it a smooth Valentine's Day? Man, listen, I'm, I, I said earlier, listen, I'm not going to go away from it simple, whether you're in a relationship or you're single. Yep. Um, if you mean like single and you're not dating or you mean like, you know, you kind of yeah. have somebody. You to date. You know, some, you know, some of you meet people on Valentine's Day. Some people cope most on Valentine's Day. Just be people actually meet people on Valentine's Day. Like how would they transition to mindset we going to actually approach a woman or approach a other person who's also seeing with them or the couples who, I mean, like, you know, trying to get that kind of feeling. Keep it simple, man. Listen, if you're single, then, you know, I would say find something that takes your mind away from, you know, oh, I see everybody else having fun or, ha- or, or happy and I'm not. Nah, find some way for you to find some peace or some joy or, or happiness in that evening if you're single. If that means going out and getting a, a drink or smoking a cigar with your bros or whatever the case is, go go ahead and do that, right? Um, for the women, it's the same thing. If whatever it is that's going to make you happy, you know, women love food, so if that's getting out and getting a bite to eat or going somewhere with the girls, whatever, do that. That's what I would suggest for people who are single because it's like, it ain't no need for you to look at everybody else and feel like, oh, this this signifies all the things that I don't have in a relationship. Like, nah, because your time will come. And while you are single, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still find ways to be happy. So um, whether it's male or female, I'm saying that, bro, whatever it is or sis, whatever it is that you feel like is going to take your mind off of the things that that discourage you about maybe being single. Do those things, you know, find a place in those areas for you to find, you know, joy in. And if you're in a relationship, I'm going back to what I said. Keep it simple, man. Creativity over spending money. If it, if it comes down to um, what you're going to do or where you're going to go or how you're going to show your love and affection. I'm, I'm, I'm a big uh, supporter of those who just say, hey, man, listen, I put something together real quick. You know, I did some in the house, put, you know, put a little bit of uh, a salmon on the on the on the uh, grill or something like that. I just, you know what I mean? Just something, something light, but at the same time, it's impactful. Like to me, I think those make the, the biggest impressions and it's going to keep you from going and going, <laughs> going broke and having to uh, file, file for uh, bankruptcy at the end of the night. You got to have you calling the uh, company talking about some, somebody stole my card and I ain't, I don't know who made this purchase. Uh, for that. Yeah. For real, for real. Oh, that's- and, uh, well, yo, we definitely appreciate you, Clarence. And all this insight, man, that you have, definitely. Um, let everybody know the website. Let everybody know when the course is coming out, man, and yep. what your social media specs again. Most definitely, man. So the website is relationshiphealing.co. That's for relationship healing coaching services. So, um, you know, it's not .com like everything else is. It's .co. You can chop that M off. Relationshiphealing.co. The uh, online course should be out in about a week and a half, two weeks. And um, like I said, man, it's just something I think is very, very much needed to bring a solution to, you know, uh, uh, the men that are looking for women who are ready to be molded, you know, and and for the women who are looking for somebody that's quality and feel like, man, that that time has passed them. This is an opportunity, I think, for women to be able to learn a little bit more about what it is that might have set themselves apart in certain men's minds. And now, you know, take advantage of an opportunity when it comes their way. And uh, with social media, man, you can find me on um, Mail Translations, which is the title of my podcast. Um, and that's everything. Social media, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and then uh, Twitter as well. So um, I appreciate y'all for giving me the opportunity as well. Like I said, and um, we, you know, this ain't the oh, last. You know it's love, brother. You know it's love. It's always been love. We family, brother. We know we family. We look out for each other. You know that. That's a fact. <laughs> All right, brother. Tell the wife I said hi. <laughs> All right, we'll do it. We'll do. Happy right. Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, brother. Hey, man, y'all take care. I appreciate you. Appreciate you, no brother. Doubt. All right, here we go. Yeah, she turn it off. Yeah, already. So now, trying to bring our next guest on. So bring on and hello, hi. Are you How are you? How you doing? Honor <laughs> yourself. Oh, Thanks for being on the show. We greatly appreciate you coming on. Oh. Um, this particular time, Valentine's Day weekend. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just talking to the fans and everything that you've done. Uh, tell a little bit about your background and your story. You know, every time Frazier and I try to do these little bios and stuff, yeah, we, we just whistle it. So we just, <laughs> please. 
<laughs> well, my name is Kiana Parler. I'm originally from Harleyville, South Carolina. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Harleyville. No, I can't say I have that one. Okay. I'm familiar with South Carolina. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, good, it's like it's almost like an hour outside of Charleston. Um, headed to Columbia, South Carolina. And okay. uh, but I've been living in Charleston since 1997. So I'm, I'm pretty much a Charlestonian. My, my life has been here. I'm raising my son here. Um, this is home for me. Um, and I've, I've been singing since I was a little girl. I started singing professionally at, at the age of eight. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I've been, I've been paying taxes since the age of 14, 15. As, as a vocalist. <laughs> um, yeah. And then from college, I went to the College of Charleston and I auditioned for American Idol. Nice. That was season two. And uh, from season two, I went on the road, I ended up going on the road with Kelly Clarkson, Clay Aiken, Ruben Studdy. I worked with a, a lot of pop artists. And uh, nice. I came back home, start my, my wedding band because Charleston is the number one destination city in the world for weddings. So mm -hmm. it's a very lucrative business here. Um, wow. And then I got a call to, to be in a band with my brothers uh, that I've known since I was a little girl. And the name of the band is Ranky Tanky. And uh, we won a Grammy on our second album. So here we are today. Um, we actually won our Grammy on the day that Kobe passed. Oh, wow. Yeah. That'd be the answer at the same time. Wow. So we were hitting the red carpet and we got the, ner the news that he passed. So by the time we got to the Staples Center, which is where the Grammys was being held, there was so many people there. It was like bittersweet, like excitement for the Grammys yeah. and then celebrating, you know, yeah. you know, not his, Yeah. So it was, it was bittersweet. And, uh, from there, we won, and then COVID happened. <laughs> so, oh, it's bad, it's bad back, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, we had this big tour plan, and then we played our last performance here in Charleston, and um, on March, I think it was 13th, or March 14th, which was the last performance here publicly for us at the Gilliard, and then the world just shut down. Like, we were watching it happen as we were getting ready for the show, shows are being canceled, you know, for other artists at the union, we didn't know how it was gonna go, you know? And then yeah. luckily for us, our dates had been rescheduled. So we had lost many dates. Just our European tour was completely canceled, uh, but wow. the US dates had, were still there. So yeah, so God has been good. Um, we're picking back up. I just got back last week. I'm so sorry. We've been playing tag with this. I've been so sick. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I never like, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Why you been? I've never been this sick before. I can't even think straight. So, <laughs> and then we ended up in, where was I last weekend? We were, was it Oklahoma? I don't remember where I was at, but it was eight degrees. Ooh. And, George. They told us to get below zero. We hauled ass. Like, <laughs> 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 the dude's got on a right. He got on a hat. A gully. Oh, you look at that city. They call you. Yeah, I'm in Jersey, son. You know what I mean? It's cold out like, here. They said something about a vortex, and I was like, we got to go. <laughs> go. <laughs> but we were just in Florida the week before. So to go from Florida weather to that, holy Jesus. <laughs> Big difference. Big difference. Oh, oh. But thank you for being patient with me. Um. Oh, oh <laughs> man, our pleasure. Our pleasure. You know, we had a guest on the show that was actually in China uh, oh, when COVID yeah. happened. Oh. And he explained the story about um, being locked down and having to stay there an extra month while yep. the whole thing was starting before he was able to come back to the United States. And it was just kind of surreal as he was explaining it because he was there for a big band show and they were on tour and in that particular area. And he was explaining how he and some of his friends um, wanted to go to a certain different part of China um, for a weekend just to relax on vacation. And then they all got locked down. And yep. it was just like, wow. So how do you get locked down in the place where the virus started? You know what I mean? 
and, and it was it was an interesting, definitely an interesting story because I don't think anybody thought that this virus would take nope. everything by storm and shut the whole world down or be yeah. as deadly yeah. as it is. I can tell you just from having COVID, I oh. still don't even couldn't even tell you how I got it. See? I still couldn't tell you how I got it. Um, I was careful, masked up, washed my hands, disinfectant, pine salt in the water, everything. Yep. And wow. literally, I thought I had an upper respiratory infection. I didn't think I had COVID until my doctor was like, listen, you got all these symptoms for COVID. You better go get a test. I'm like, I'm not getting no test. I don't got COVID. <laughs> and then when I couldn't breathe, uh, I was like, okay, I got to go get a COVID test. <laughs> and they go said, yeah. they were like, yeah, you got COVID. Oh, my God. I'm Crazy. sorry. Craziness. Yeah, I'm sorry. Craziness. You got Superman. So that was a big thing for me. I'm like, wait, you got what? How? When? Where? You ain't going nowhere. Like, how did you get it? And like, he told me, I was, like, I was shocked. I literally was like speechless, and I'm very few don't talk very much. I don't talk all the time. So. You and me, <laughs> I, even say, I sat in the chair for almost five minutes. I didn't want to cry because I was just like, that, that was not going to help me. So at least I know what it is now. Let's deal with it from here. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Because like I said, I thought I had an upper respiratory infection because I started getting shortness of breath. Yeah, see that's what, what you diagnosed me and all my friends with before, like last, the year before last, like December, January, before all of this happened, before it had a name, we all had upper respiratory infection and, and the flu and pneumonia, yeah. but it all led back to the same nine friends of mine. We were all sick and it was oh. all the same symptoms as COVID, but wow. I also had an upper respiratory infection. Ooh. So I believe we've already had it in my house, except for my son. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I, where, where do we go from here? <laughs> like Exactly. Absolutely. Oh, we're going to get through it now that, you know, there's a vaccine in place. Thank God for that. But let's uh, switch gears real quick. How was it, how's your life been, even though with COVID, winning a Grammy? Because not too many people can say that they've done that. True. Uh, well, my son is my reminder that I'm still mom. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's 14. Um, I'm a full-time mom when I'm home. Like that, that's my job. I do nothing else but sing and, and I'm a parent to this boy. Um <laughs> it's his world. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, for us and uh, you tell me you're gonna glide down the house and moonwalk like Michael Jackson. Nothing? Listen, when I when I won, when we won, you know, he called me and he said, Mommy, have you seen Cardi B? Have you seen Migos? He didn't even ask about anything that he had going on. He <laughs> And Migos. I was like, you know, we just won, right? <laughs> yeah, that's my kid. So, <laughs> like, Mom, I know you're going to win it, Mom. We know that you're going to win it. Man, what about the other people? You get no yeah, I didn't know who else was there. I was like, well, damn, what about me? What about us? He um, every day. <laughs> I called him one night trying to um, go on Snapchat with my Grammy. I was like, no, sir, we don't play with that. Put it, put it right back down. We don't fall. We don't do that. I earned that. Don't um, <laughs> don't you, messed up with you. you messed everything up. He was about to be the coolest kid on earth. Now, all of a sudden, he's just. Yeah. <laughs> he's just. <laughs> yeah. That's it. He's, he's just. Lord. Lord. He up on Instagram, Fred. That Grammy was going to get him a million followers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that. And I didn't. You know, these kids and their followers are going viral. It's serious. Oh, yeah. What? Oh yeah. Yep. A nine year old kid without the highest pay, highest pay YouTube is a nine eight year old kid. Yes. She brings in. She brings in George. Twenty five million dollars. Tell me what do they see for twenty five million? Because I'm doing something wrong. I'm and, just worried about the taxes. I ain't gonna lie. How much you paying? In right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like. I mean, how do you know how to pay taxes? You're only eight years old. Like, who pay your taxes? <laughs> you yeah, old. I love to see how they work that out. Um, but you I mean, know, this, that was crazy. The list was crazy. I'm like, and the top three of the top three are under twenty. The top two are under twenty. The top three are under twenty. They have only one person there. Only one person. I think six who is over thirty. We're in business. Yeah, because yeah, she's like, I think she makes. She brings in about. Eight million, well, eight to nine million, give or take. So she's still behind 
a lot. <laughs> what do you so, man, I don't worry about that. Like you said, you don't got no dependents, and you nine years old making twenty five million dollars. I guarantee she's paying eighty percent in taxes. Yep. You know what I mean? Because the parents can't claim her. You know what I mean? So nope. it's crazy. Lord, wow. but you know, um, life for us after the Grammys, it's um, it's been a blessing that we haven't seen a big financial hit. We were able to reschedule. Yeah. Um, we we done we done the Stephen Colbert show. Everything's become virtually so virtual. So things that we would normally do in studio, yeah, we're now doing it from home. So we did Stephen Colbert at home series, and um, we did something else with ESPN that's that's airing in in two weeks I think, and mm -hmm. some other stuff for the, yeah. like different things that, that we're able to do virtually. You know, since since all of this happened, and we're still trying to figure that that part out. You know, gotcha. Like I got some other drops and stuff to do after I get off with you guys, but <laughs> this is the this is the new normal for us. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, is it easier for you not to travel? Because I know for a fact that me not traveling has been a blessing. Because one, I can literally just raise up, wash my face, and bang, I'm there in the moment. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to, oh, I gotta get dressed. No, <laughs> you can only see me from here. Exactly. You know what I mean? I don't have to do anything else. And even yeah. when I'm teaching classes, I'm in full uniform, so my, my attire is still correct. You see what I'm saying? But it's cheaper. I must spend as much money as I'm on gas, and I find <laughs> out that I'm not missing as many kids' events anymore because I'm not traveling either up north yeah. or going yeah. this place or that place. Everything is virtual. Yeah, you know, it, it's been – well, for me, when I'm not on the road, I'm in the house. Like, I, if we're off for, like, two weeks, I don't come out of the house. I only come out of the house when I'm forced, I'm forced out of the house. So that whole three month, four month lockdown was, I was excited because this is all I do anyway when I'm not on the road, but I've been on the road for over 10 years. Um, yeah, so that's my, that's been my life, you know, for so long. Um, I kind of miss it because it's been a part of my routine, you know? Yep. And, um, but I, I, I tried taking my son out when he was maybe three or four, but that didn't work out. The road isn't no place for a kid when you don't have a nanny. Yeah. And, um, like, I've, I've, I've only known the road for so long. And being home, I take advantage of sleeping. I just sleep and I'm in the house. I don't even watch movies. I'm just in the house sleeping. And on you, I watch a lot of YouTube. I watch a lot of vloggers on YouTube. And yeah. uh, that's about it. So it's a blessing. Hey, you don't binge Netflix? Like, you don't catch up on the whole <laughs> season that you missed? <laughs> The bloggers that I follow, they they get such good reviews that I don't even have to watch. I just get it all from them. Oh wow! Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, I okay. even watch it. You, I watch The Breakfast Club on YouTube. I watch um, Wendy Williams on YouTube because I get to see. I don't want to see the whole show. I know what portions yeah. I want to see. You know, so that that's. that's right, right. I'm not a movie buff at all. Wow, that's interesting. They have a girl flick, the lady, the romantic flick. No, no, he's like, he's either. No, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. Writing process has your writing process for songwriting gone up, uh, because of COVID, or is it just yeah. still my what? Songwriting. your writing process? Oh, well, you know, um, my songs come to me in my in my sleep. So, yeah, it's the strangest thing. Like, when freedom came to me when I was, I was going through something. I just gotten off a really bad phone call from one of my attorneys. And that's how freedom came about. When the band was in sound check, and I came back in, and I can't even talk about what he said. But all I can say is, from that phone call, I just, it came to me that none of us are really free. And if America realized that, no matter what color we are, we are not free. We you know we're all part of this, whatever you want to call it right now. You know, that's when in the part of freedom I said, oh, say, can you see, you know, we ain't free because none of us are free. You know, being colored, person of color, we're, we're definitely not free. But if everybody realized, hold up, they got me stuck here, 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 here. We're, we're not all free. I think we would we would do better with fighting for our freedom as as a whole, you know? Yeah, and right, right. Yeah, exactly. so that's where freedom came from. Um, 
But yeah, my dream, my songs come to me. I, I think I did about 13 songs so far since COVID, but we haven't started working on any of those yet. We just did a song with um, Mark Bryan from Hootie and the Blowfish. Uh, there's a Rosa Parks mm -hmm. uh, project that's being at, uh, was it the Lincoln Museum? Was it the, the Library of Congress? I'm sorry. And oh. we just did a, a song for that project and Jennifer Hudson and Smokey Robinson. There's a lot of big names on that project. We just wrapped that up two weeks ago. And um, nice. so that's, that's the next thing that's going to be released Juneteenth. And uh, so we, we haven't started working on any new stuff yet as a band yet. Because and, being, winning a Grammy, has it opened a lot of doors for you? Like people that wouldn't talk to yep. you, are they blowing up yep. your phone now? No, not really. <laughs> well, really. They won't. Really? Really? No, like, no. Uh, well, I'm an introvert, so maybe that's the problem. Um, <laughs> okay. So, I'm a real introvert. Um, no, my circle is, is pretty small. Like, you know, we, we met friends on the road. Like, like we, we'll see, like, Mavis Staple, we'll see the, the Warren Treaty. I don't know, have you guys heard of the Warren Treaty? Yes. It's a husband and wife group. Um, you remember from Sister Act 2, uh, when Lauren Hill and, and the, the girls sang, what was it, uh, His Eyes is on the Sparrow together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the short-haired girl, uh, Tanya Blunt, she and her husband, they have a band called the Warren Treaty. Um, we, we've become cool with them. They're, they're blowing up. Nice. The, I don't know if you call it. Country soul scene. Oh, you should hear yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, they're really good. So she's uh, she's still working and, and they're doing good. So we become friends with a lot of people, but no, nobody's blowing up. The, the music industry has really changed. Really yeah. Has, yeah. That is true. Like, what are some of the best artists you ever worked with? Um, Before Ranky Tanky, I was on the road with. with well, I've been out. I've been with Kelly Clarkson since season two of since her first tour. But we went out with um, Maroon Five, so oh, yeah. So I was on the road with them, and uh, so that was the last major major tour that I, I've done. And uh, and then with Ranky Tanky, we we've been with out with Bobby McFerrin. You know, he's a he's a legend. Oh yeah. And uh, so that that was really big for us. And Lisa Fisher. I don't know if you guys remember Lisa Fisher. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So we we work with a lot of um legendary artists, you know. Um but that that's about it for now. I've been on the road for so long. Like I've done I think Stephen Colbert and um that was the only show I had not ever done. I've done all the sure. other talk shows and, and late night shows, but with yep. other artists, but with Ranky Tanky doing um Colbert and the Today Show and NPR and all these other shows that we've done together as a band that that's been life changing for me to experience these shows with my brothers because I've known these guys since I was a teenager. So, wow! Right? So, yeah, that's nice. That's, that's gotta be like a great thing. Like, wait, I watch you guys play in practice, but now I'm actually in it. Uh -huh. Like, hey, little kid, get a candy shop, get the first candy. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, the, the Grammys was it was an interesting. Um, set up like what you guys don't see on television there's a whole nother big room and show that happens before what you see on television where all the artists like over 100 200 artists are oh, wow. announced so you know how when they say on the show oh earlier this evening this is who won because it was a whole nother show before that so y'all get to see like this um, much of what wow. really happened that day that's a, that's right the that's about a short <laughs> Yeah, we knew that all day. All day. <laughs> yeah, so wow. yeah, but um th that was the most life-changing experience, like seeing these artists and, and walking the red carpet that I've watched on television since I was a little girl. Yep, that's gotta oh. be crazy. So, ask you though, who designed your dress? You know, everybody go crazy who designed dresses on the red carpets. Who got your dress? Who designed your dress? Well, I will. I will. Master um, by this art, black artist. Her name was Melissa Mitchell. She's out of Atlanta, Georgia, and um, she brings her art to life and fashion. Just she started drawing one night, and she's taken off. She has a line with Spanx, and Spanx um, dressed me as well. And I had another stylist here, but Melissa did my main, my main, you know, outfit. But 
Nice. Y'all should check her out too, because she's a sister and she she just did what three Peloton stores and she did uh -huh. This super info, I got her. <laughs> yeah, I will. She's on my page and she did the Marta station as well in Atlanta. Like she is, she's going, she dresses, she styles, um, she's done stuff for Lupita, what Lupita, I can't pronounce her last name. <laughs> Black Panther. Um, Whoa, she's, yeah. Like she's done a lot of people. Like, yeah, so you should definitely check her out. If you ever send me info, I would definitely reach out to her for sure. I will. I will. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Oh, so, real man. quick, I have a question again about your writing and how it works. You said because you write from dreams. You know, I have dreams and I have things in dreams, but by the time I wake up, I forget it. So, how do you keep your memory fresh? Do you keep a tape recorder by the bed? Because I have million dollar dreams, but when I wake up, I'm like, man, I forgot. Yeah, that used to happen to me. But you know, um, do you? I know we pray before we go to sleep, but do you set your intentions before you go to sleep? No, I pray when I get up, but I don't pray when I go to sleep. I might even try that. Thank you. Yeah, you yeah. should, you should pray, set your intentions. Like I started doing that because my dream, my songs will leave me too. But I started keeping my um, voice memos. And I would get up, so I wouldn't wake my boyfriend up. I would go in the closet and just hum it or catch it while I can. And, and mm -hmm. sometimes it sounds like, what in the hell was that? But, you know, especially if I got it. I hate it when I lose a good bridge of a song in my sleep. But I just keep my phone nearby. I sleep with my phone under my pillow because I never know when it's going to happen. And But I set my intentions. Like, I want to dream about love, positive. Like, I just set, I, I, I recently learned that. You set your intention before you go to sleep, it'll change your life. It really will. Wow. Oh, wow. That's nice to know because I use the voice, voice notes to dictate my chapters for my book. So, yeah, that, I, I didn't even think about that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a that's food for thought right there. That's food for the mind right there. <laughs> there's no way with that. Right. Hold on. Oh, voice notes? That's how I got these books done. Why yeah. did I think of that? <laughs> yeah, my band and my band, all my band members are like that. Like, if I hum something, they'll say, "Stop, go record that right now," and then we'll we'll get back to it. Like, if you have to because you start yes. saying, "Oh, here's the pieces of the puzzle," you know. Like, even with me writing down, like you know, the law of attraction, my visions and, and what I want before even before the vision board, I would write it down, yep. and then I'll go back. Years later, be like, listen, this was on my vision in my notes, not my vision board because I never made one. But yeah. I would write down, you know, what it was that I would want and just keep looking at it. And then it, it was there. It, it was happening, not in my time, yeah. but in the universe's time when, you know, okay. it all comes together. Like, never in a million years would I thought that out of all the artists that I've worked with and recorded with, that I would come back to Charleston and win a Grammy with my brothers that I've known since I was a little girl. Who knew? Right. You know? Right. It's amazing. That's, that's amazing. I would tell you, like, I was telling George, I thought I had the stuff I did ahead of time. Yeah. And we were down, bitch, I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to start a TV <laughs> later on. I'm going to start a radio station. I'm going to start this. And then all you do is, while you did music, I did write too in the head. Couldn't sing a lick. Couldn't even rap a lick. But I can write some stuff. So all you do is you write. <laughs> yeah. so, the funny thing they were trying to get me to get the singer to sing how I want it, something like that. You got to do this. They be like, uh. So I learned little notes. Oh, I learned little small notes. Not, not great, but just enough to get the artist to understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So I wrote, that's how I started writing. So it been that bit of an ear. Now I can tell if a song hit. No, that ain't going to work for you, bro. Mm, work. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm mm. <laughs> let, me, let me my friend out. And it was so funny. The girl was taking super terrible to super good the one day with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Kirk Franklin's not a singer. Kirk Franklin cannot sing. He's not a singer at all, but he's an amazing writer and composer, you know? Yep, he's my idol. <laughs> when it comes to that, come on, no 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 I want to be a conductor. I want to be a conductor of a musical, a big officer. Oh, wow. That's what my dream I want to do. Because my, my, one of my idols was my band director. He played every instrument, in, every instrument. he played drum, everything. So I want to do the same thing. I play saxophone. I play drums. I play, I play trumpet. Tuba? Uh, I don't work for it. I work for it. <laughs> oh, more long enough. But that was really sweet. Remember show on person I get number seven? Yeah, it works for me to do it. But I take it out of the picture. But then they said, no, what? you know what? You can start writing. So I started actually writing music. Mm -hmm. And 
what well, got me inspired was when we was in the band and he made a you know it was song in the mood. Yeah. There are very few parts for flutes and that's instruments, right? Yeah. He wrote a lot of parts are in. Like if you notice there, there's saxophone parts. There's no saxophone part really in in the mood. But he, he, wrote wrote, he wrote it in. And then he said, cause yo, previous one heard saxophone previously, but it was too complicated for us to actually get. So he actually modified it so that we could actually play it. So he had a the professional version, and we had the high school very relearn. <laughs> It's my favorite song of the year. I love that song for the drums. I, I play flute, but it's, been, so a long time. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> hey, flute players to me have the best job of all. They have all the melodies. Yep. All the yep. melodies go on the flute. I got Listen, my boots. Album, let me play the flute in this band. I'm like, you know what? This next album, I'm going to play the flute. Y'all don't get a choice. I'm I got you all beat. I played recorder in middle school. You know that little recorder they give you yes. bring it home? Yes, yes. I got that. Uh, Mary had a little lamb joint. That's what I got off the recorder, and I'm <laughs> good. <laughs> I could play a talent. Girl. That's a talent. <laughs> you, you, like, you good, cause, boy. I was terrible with that thing. Uh, I can never get yeah. that right. Man, put it this way. Yeah. I'd rather play the saxophone before I pick up a recorder. Yep, because it's the similarities, very similar, but I couldn't play the clarinet either. So that took me over that clarinet either. Oh man, the clarinet! When I was in band and we had a trial, if you could play, oh man, I want to leave for drums. I was in drums. There were too many there, so I wanted yeah. to move so I could actually get some playing time in. Not sit on the bench. So I'm looking like clarinet, man. You heard something so terrible. I believe the animals start howling when they heard me play it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they were killing me. Oh, they were Not me. My mama tried to kill me. They were like, shut up. That's too loud. So I, oh, wow. So when I finally got to the saxophone, what got me into it was Louis Armstrong. I listened to Louis Armstrong. But you remember the saxophone was on um, Tonight Show or, or Cena Hall? He would play a solo all the time. I'm like this. Then Kenny G. I want to mm. be like Kenny G. But well, I want to be like Kenny G. But I swear I was Kenny G. <laughs> Kenny G curly hair. Oh, yeah. Everybody's oh, yeah. wedding go to music for cocktail hour when you're waiting on the bride and groom to finish taking pictures. <laughs> it's a Kenny right. G music. <laughs> yeah, yeah and everything. Yeah. You finna blue here say go Kenny G. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, he's so good. Mother, then what got me too? I try to play the guitar. BB King. Oh. I, I couldn't touch that man. I, I don't know how he did it. He That's made it clean. I could touch it. <laughs> it's a gift. It's a gift. There's a lady by the name of Ruthie Foster um, that we met on the road. She's a blues, black blue blues vocalist and guitar player. She's bad. Wow. Oh my God. Her live show. And she has ties in Charleston, South Carolina as well. So wow. we meet many people that have connections to Charleston. It's crazy. Yeah. You'd be right. surprised. But sometimes yeah. some people like, look at Indiana. Look at Indiana. It produced a lot of the best artists. Look at Michael Jackson. Several other artists came out. Erie, Indiana. Listen, all the time. Erie, Indiana. Yep. There's a lot of superstars. Yep. You would think, look at Charleston, small town, but guess what? It produced a lot of stars. You yep. know, a lot of, a lot of people like big cities like Atlanta. It's so big to nobody get opportunity because everybody there. Everybody. It's, it's small town. You get highlight a little bit. I think you highlight a little better small towns. That's me. You mean get out there because you know, they like, oh, small town, girl, you can blow. <laughs> Well, you know, like I said, for, for Ranky Tanky, um, when we went into the studio for the second album, we didn't go into the studio to make an album to win a Grammy. We went into the studio to make an album where we honored our Gullah ancestors. And because we were never recognized on worldwide musically, you know, uh -huh. outside of someone yeah. being from Charleston or jazz music, or, you know, a lot of people um, say we sound like, our sound is similar and the way we speak is New Orleans, you know, people from yeah. New Orleans. And, and there's a whole nother story behind that. But we went into the studio with good intentions of we're gonna make good music to broaden, you know, people's minds. Like they know Michael Rowe wrote a show, a, a Kumbaya, not knowing that song was started here in, in the Gullah community, you know? That's yeah. one of the people yeah. saw 
So we just put a, a fresh twist on a new twist for, for new new ears and new listeners, you know, who'd never heard of the Gullah people, their their ancestors, you know. And nice. uh, yeah, so for us to be recognized at the Grammy, that was the first time the Gullah community has ever been recognized on a, a stage of that magnitude, you know, and at that level. So it, it was, it's, it's been a, a blessing just to be a part of making history for South Carolina and our people. It's like a win for the entire community, not, not just for Randy Tanky. So, yeah. Definitely. 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 Wait, you know I got to put something, I got to put something on a spot. You know I got to put something on a spot, right? We you say you're the first Grammy award winner single be on our show? Congratulations. <laughs> oh, you want to see my Grammy? You gotta see the Grammy. Yes, it is. Ooh, look at it. Ooh, it's That's what I'm one. talking about. It's nice and shiny. Yeah, yeah, shiny. Man. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I want to grab you this hand. <laughs> yeah, I'm putting back up. You smile. Huh? <laughs> you see yeah, you we smile. got some nice gifts when we won, man. They, they did us all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, can, we, can I have a little taste of the Grammy World Winner Sing on the show? Give me a little taste. Oh, you want me to sing? What do you want me to sing? Just a small piece. Just a small piece. Whatever you want. Just a small piece. Like what? Pick, you pick. It's up to you. You pick. Good. Well, I only have clearance to sing Ranky Tanky songs so y'all don't get flagged. All right. Hey, I got, I got there a go. little back there. You see, he's waving to you guys. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, Take our homes and take our names. They sit behind four walls is where we'll remain. Take our dreams, they pull us apart. But they'll never know our strength, they'll never know our hearts. We want freedom, we want freedom. We want freedom, we want freedom. Oh, say, can you see? We ain't free, yeah, yeah. Yes. Why yes. two homes the first I've ever done that. <laughs> Man, well, we definitely appreciate it. We Man, definitely we appreciate, appreciate it. it. We took the home just then. We took the home just then. We're all about to go little southern oh, southern man. right there, boy. Woo. Thank y'all. Absolutely. Everybody will find you on social media. Um, you can find me uh, on Instagram, Kiana Parlor, um, Ranky Tanky Music on Instagram, Ranky Tanky on Facebook, and Ranky Tanky Music on um, Twitter. Right. But definitely follow right. us on Instagram. We got some some good things coming on. Well, definitely. Well, we family now. We family now. Right. Family. Just say that You know, you're always welcome on the show. We definitely want to have you back when you drop those 13 songs that you wrote yeah. or whatever. Oh, yeah. Because Man, look, you made my night. The oh, time so cold, oh, baby. You know, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, good. I'm so good right now. I'm gonna go right now. I'm gonna be a super fan now. You in trouble? I'm a super fan now. Oh, well, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, man, it's amazing, man. Oh, wow. Well, thank God you so much. You we appreciate you. We definitely appreciate you for being on the show. All right, have a good night. You too. Appreciate yeah. you. So much. Right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Right. Oh wow! Whoa! Yeah. And then we got a song. Y'all can't say that we're not doing big things, right? So check us out next week. We have other shows coming. But this made the weekend, and I hope it worked out for you on Valentine's. Hey, well, this, this is George. Hey, this is Fred. Happy Valentine's. That was real talk with George and Fraser. Peace, y'all. Peace. There you go.